Welcome to Soul Food, a ministry of Calvary Chapel, Princeton, West Virginia. If you're new to Calvary Chapel, maybe you don't know, um, we teach through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Um, I've been doing 1 Thessalonians, now we're in the book of 2 Thessalonians. And uh, once again, as we return to our study, you probably see that it deals a lot with prophecy. Now some folks may say, well, you know, I, I don't want to learn about prophecy. It's kind of nebulous and, and it's divisional and some people argue over it and it's hard for me to understand and I really don't want to wrestle with prophecy. But did you know that almost one third of the Bible is prophecy? So if we skip it, we're going to be ignorant of a third of the Bible. The other thing I like about the Bible is its accuracy record. It's not 50% accurate. It's not 75% accurate. Its record is it's 100% accurate. No other book can claim that, the Book of Mormon, the Koran, or any other religious book can, can claim that it has that accuracy rate. It's been proven historically, archaeologically, and time has shown that the Bible is 100% accurate. Now, why is that important? Because that lets you know you can trust it. That should bolster our faith. That should encourage us that we don't have to be in the dark. We don't have to wonder, is this really real? Because the Bible is 100% accurate. While most Christians uh, are familiar with the first coming of Christ, it's the second coming that gets the most ink in the Bible. Reference to the second coming outnumber the first coming by a margin of 8 to 1. Scholars count 1,845 references to the second coming, which includes 318 in the New Testament. Christ's return is emphasized in no less than 17 Old Testament books, and his return is emph emphasized in no less than, uh, or in the seven out of ten chapters of the New Testament. So it's talked about in 17 books of the Old Testament and seven out of ten chapters in the New Testament. The Lord himself referred to his return 21 times. Faith is the only subject that is more dominant in the New Testament than the return of Christ. And that first coming, there were 300 plus prophecies fulfilled in, when Jesus came the first time. And many in that day, the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, so, so what, and, uh, thought they were confused and thought, well, you know, these, these Old Testament prophecies can't be literal. They must be allegorical. They must be p word pictures to explain things that we don't understand because how could, how could our Messiah be born of a virgin? How could he be born in Bethlehem and be called a Nazarene? And, and Isaiah says he's going to bru be bruised and suffer, and we're not looking for someone to be bruised and suffered, suffering. We're looking for a king to lead us to victory over all of our enemies. So in that day, there were a lot of folks that said, you know, these must be allegories. He's coming to deliver us. But the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus' first coming were fulfilled literally. He was born of a virgin. He was born in Bethlehem. He was called the Nazarene. He was of the house and lineage of David. He was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. He was bruised, beaten, mocked, crucified. They cast lots for his garments. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. And on and on and on. All these precise details were fulfilled literally. So why would we think the details of his second coming would be allegorical and not be literal? Paul told us in 1 Thessalonians to comfort each other with the fact that Jesus, as just as Jesus was resurrected from the grave, we too would live beyond death. Paul had dealt with the second coming in the first letter to the Thessalonians, but obviously this issue is still an ongoing problem because here in 2 Thessalonians, he's addressing it again. What amazes me is that Paul was only in Thessalonica for three weeks. Not only did he plant a church, but he taught them about the end times and Christ's return. That is amazing. Let's look at chapter 2. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled 
either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. Now remember, as we've taught before, just a little bit of background, the Thessal Thessalonica was a thriving metropolis. It was a port city. There was all kinds of false religions there. There was all kinds of trade and traffic going on. There was all kinds of philosophies. And Paul only got to spend three weeks there before the people who were persecuting him forced him to leave. And he sent Timothy back to see how they were doing. And when Timothy came back, he wrote these letters to them. Uh, these people had been converted from idols, from worshiping false idols, and because uh, the Jews didn't care for the preaching of Jesus, they were persecuting the church. The church was being persecuted heavily. And many in that church uh, had thought that the rapture was so imminent that when their loved ones died, they thought they had missed it. And they thought they were in the tribulation, the great tribulation period, and because of the, the suffering that they were facing. So those folks were all upset and stirred up. And Paul, is, as we look at this second letter, this problem hasn't gone away. And Paul, I want you to look at that verse. He says, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering to him. I notice that Paul ties those two things together. They're not two events. They're one event. His coming and our gathering to him. It's one event, not two. And Paul's saying, don't be shaken if you're a believer and if he had already come, guess what? You wouldn't be here. If you're a believer, you've surrendered your life to Christ, you've asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, no matter what the persecutions that you're facing, we're still not in the great tribulation. Because when he comes, he's coming for you. So Paul ties those two events together. They are connected, his coming and our gathering. It's one event. We are the reason for his coming. Paul says, don't be shaken in mind or troubled. Where do we usually get attacked? It's usually our mind, isn't it? We overthink things. You know, it's like the, I, I used to hear old preachers say, you can't stop birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from building a nest in your hair. And you know, the devil will put thoughts in your mind, and he will try to create fear because fear is the opposite of faith. And he will use the events and the circumstances around the world to make you question well, you know, am I on the right track? Is this really true? Is Jesus really care that much for me? He's going to protect me from the chaos that's coming in the world. But Paul says, don't be shaken in mind or troubled, either by some spirit. Well, obviously there was someone in the church giving a, uh, uh, supposedly under the influence of the Holy Spirit, giving some kind of word saying, hey, we're in the tribulation. Paul says, don't believe that. Don't believe that. Secondly, he said, if there's someone teaching it, don't believe that. And evidently there was a fraudulent letter that was floating around. And Paul says, don't believe that either. I didn't send a letter saying we're in the great tribulation. So Paul had to deal with these problems. There, was, there were people who were saying that they were speaking by the Spirit of God saying we're in the tribulation. There were people who were teaching that. And then there was this false letter that was supposedly from Paul that wasn't real. So Paul says, don't let those things bother you. That's a good lesson for us because any time Paul had taught these, these people the Christian doctrine of the end time, and any time someone comes to you with something that doesn't line up with the Word of God, guess who's wrong? It's not the Bible. It's their teaching. If it doesn't line up with the Bible, it's wrong. Let's look at verse 3. Paul says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for the day of the Lord will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin re is revealed the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself is, that he is God. This is a very controversial verse in the Bible. And let me explain. There are multiple views of end time events. Next slide, please. As if you can see there, <clears throat> there are basically four views. There is what is called a pre-tribulation rapture, a mid-tribulation rapture, a post-tribulation rapture, and a new, new one on the scene is called the pre-wrath uh, uh, view. What does that mean? Well, basically, the pre-tribulation means just what it sounds like, that the, the Christ is coming for the church before the great tribulation, coming for his people. Mid-tribulation... Uh, philosophers believe that Christians will have to go to, through the first 
three and a half years of this great tribulation. Um, the post-tribulation people believe that God, the church will go through all seven years of the great tribulation talked about in Revelation. And the post-wrath um, position is that uh, they will go through the end time in almost the entire part of the seven year tribulation but that the real wrath of God isn't poured out until the last trumpets uh, you'll experience the bowls and the first trumpets but the last trumpet is the real wrath of God and the church will be taken then so it's kind of confusing isn't it if you haven't heard this I, I don't know if you have or haven't but um, there are the four beliefs which one is right I believe the first one is right, and I want to talk to you today about that. The pre-tribulation rapture. Why do I believe it's right? First of all, in these verses we're looking at here, Paul is talking about rapture versus return. The New Testament describes two facets of Christ's return. He will come for his church and escort her to his father's house. Remember in John 14, 3, Jesus said this, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And then there is a second phase where he will come with his saints when he descends from heaven to judge the enemies and establish his glorious kingdom, which is called the thousand-year reign. And that's, there's Zechariah 14, 4 and 5 says, And in that day, in the first one, he didn't, he, it says he meets us in the air. In that but in Zechariah, he says, In that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in, in two from east to west, making a large valley. And in 1 Thessalonians 3.13, he said that, the scripture says this, So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with his saints. Now, both of these describe the Lord's coming, but their differences indicate there are two unique stages occurring at separate times. Between these stages, the tribulation happens. Stage one, the rapture, which is imminent and signless and occur, it could occur at any moment. It's actually the next event on God's prophetic calendar and on his schedule. Remember, Paul told us in 1 Thessalonians 1.10 to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Stage two of his coming is the second coming. On the other hand, which will be preceded by numerous signs. If you look in Matthew chapter 24, the scripture says this, talking about Jesus. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear, hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he that endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world to all the nations. Then the end will come. So there's a lot of other signs in that chapter given. I didn't go on because we don't have time. But how can his coming be both signless and then preceded by many signs? Well, pre-tribulation rapture view is the only one that harmonizes these two descriptions by calling them two stages of the same event. Next slide, please. I don't know if you can read that or not. But you can see here, I have listed the differences in the rapture and the second coming. Christ is coming for his church. Christ is coming with his church. Christ is coming uh, to reward his saints. Christ is coming to judge the world. And you can read through that list. I Hopefully your eyes are better than mine and you can see that. <laughs> John MacArthur said this, 
Scripture suggests that the second coming occurs in two stages. First, the rapture when he comes for his saints and they are caught up to meet him in the air. And second, his return to earth when he comes with his saints to execute judgment on his enemies. Jude 1.14 says this, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, saying also, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Now why do I believe that? I think there's a couple of good points in this verse we're looking at. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians for evidence that believers are exempt from God's wrath in the coming tribulation. There are four strong points here. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, it says uh, here, you turn to God from, live, from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. Now Paul says you've got to look for Jesus. He's going to rescue you from the wrath that's coming. Well, you might say that, well, he's talking about hell since Paul has been discussing the salvation of the Thessalonians and that interpretation is possible. But it seems better to view this as the wrath of the tribulation period that Jesus is rescuing his people from by his coming. He is coming from heaven to deliver his church from the wrath that's going to be poured out on all those who have rejected his son. He's coming to deliver us from this wrath and his means of deliverance for us is his coming. There's compelling evidence here for the pre-tribulation position, assuming the entire tribulation is the wrath of God, not just a part of it. If you've read those bowl and trumpet judgments in Revelation, it's pretty graphic and it's pretty scary. Many scholars also say that, that this point is backed up by the fact that many places in the Old Testament, this is called the time of Jacob's trouble. It's called the day of wrath and the, the day of Jacob's trouble, which means it's a time for the Jewish people to open their eyes and accept Jesus as Messiah. It's a time for them to repent and come to God. Secondly, the second point that I would like to point out is that there's a sequence of events that we can follow here that, that we can anticipate. In 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, verses 13 and, and chapter 5, verse 9, there is the rapture and then the day of the Lord. Look at these scriptures. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. For, we who, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you, watch this part, by the word of the Lord, also notice that he said that, it's not just Paul's opinion. By the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an angel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. It wouldn't be much comfort if we had to face all the tribulation, turmoil, chaos, and wrath. So why is Paul saying comfort yourself with these words? Because I think that supports the pre-tribulation view. Now look at the day of the Lord part of chapter 5. Verse 3 says this, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those that sleep, sleep at night, and those that get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, there it is again, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort one another and edify one another just as you are doing. So we have, we have the fact that there is a sequence of events that we can anticipate. We also have... Uh, thirdly, 
there's just two different groups he's talking to here. And I want to look, look at that verse we just read. Notice what he says here in this, this verse we just went over. He says, but concerning the times and seasons, brethren, who? The believer. You have no need that I should write to you. Because who? You, the believer, know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. But when they, who's they? The unbeliever, say peace and safety. And you know, that's how politicians get power. They always promise peace and safety. Every dictator that's ever lived, from Hitler, Antiochus Epiphanes, Nero, they all promise peace and safety. If you'll just give up this, you'll have peace and safety. When they say peace and safety, then comes sudden destruction upon who? Them. The unbeliever. And look at the next part. He says, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so this day should overtake you as a thief. You are sons of light. Notice the difference. So thirdly, Paul is not only talking about a sequence of events, but he's talking to two, two groups of people. And the fourth point I'd like to make is that he's saying here, that God has not appointed us to wrath in verse 9, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's an appointment for us to keep. If you have asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, you have an appointment with him, an appointment to be delivered from this coming chaos that's coming on the earth. And also, the unbeliever has an appointment. They have an appointment with the day of the Lord, the seven-year tribulation, the time of chaos and and, and horror like the world has never seen. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Now, a lot of folks believe that this verse refers to the wrath of hell. But the Thessalonians had already been assured that they would escape the wrath of hell. If you remember our study, when we were back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, the scripture said, Knowing, beloved, your election by God. What does that mean? That means Paul had tutored them and said, look, you might think you chose God, but God chose you. You might think that, you know, we, we, we always say, you know, have you, do you know uh, Christ? But you know what's more important is that Christ knows you. What did Jesus say in the last days? He said, many are going to come to me and say, Lord, I did this in your name. I cast out devils. I healed the sick. I did all these marvelous works. And what did Jesus say in Matthew? Depart from me. I never knew you. So your election, you're chosen by God. You're not here by, in, by an accident. You're not in this place by accident. You're not hearing the word of God by accident. It's because God has chosen you to be his son. Now you have the opportunity to accept that or you can reject that. And the world for the most part is rejecting it, isn't it? So, you know, some po folks would say that, that that refers to hell, but I don't think it does. Because Paul said, knowing, beloved, your election by God. Moreover, in the context of this, this particular scripture in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 8, uh, the wrath Paul has been discussing is not eternal punishment in hell, but the day of the Lord, the wrath of the day of the Lord. That's the wrath that believers will be delivered from. John Walford said this. In this passage, Paul is clearly expressing... Uh, in this passage, Paul is ex expressly saying our appointment is to be caught up to be with Christ. The appointment of the world is the day of the Lord, the day of wrath. One cannot keep both these appointments. Some say that this verse that we're looking at here also denies a pre-trib rapture view, uh, and I'll explain that now. The Antichrist, they say, has to be revealed first is what this scripture is saying. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin, who is the Antichrist, is revealed, the son of perdition or the son of waste. That's what they also call Judas, by the way. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits, in, sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he's God. A lot of folks say, aha, that proves that we're going through part of the tribulation because it says there's going to be a falling away and a man of sin is going to be revealed, so we're going to have to go through the tri tribulation period. Well, actually, it doesn't say that because the word falling away is the Greek word apostasia. 
It's used twice in the New Testament as a noun, and here, here and in the books of Acts 20:21, 20, where it's talking about Paul was accused of teaching the Jews to depart from Moses' teaching uh, or moving away and forsaking what they had taught. And that's kind of the mindset that we have when we see the word apostasy or apostasia. We think it means to err from scripture or to err from sound doctrine or to fall away from sound doctrine. So Paul was getting accused of that in Acts 21, 21 because he was saying, hey, if you've accepted Jesus, you don't have to be circumcised. And that infuriated the Jews. They're saying, well, you're teaching a departing and apostasy from the law of Moses. Okay? So that's one mindset about that word apostasia. But the word is used as a verb 15 times in the New Testament. And 13 of the 15 times, it's used to mean to depart physically. Not from theology or falling from a teaching point, but to leave a place or to leave a group or to leave the ungodly. It's used when Paul said, it's the same phrase used when Paul asked for the thorn in the flesh to depart from him. It was that same word, apostasia. So it can mean deflection or departure from a place according to Liddell and Scott's Greek lexicon. And Kenneth Wiest from Moody Bible College, who is the foremost Greek scholar for English speaking today, says that the first and foremost use of apostasia means a departure from a place and then secondly it can mean leaving sound doctrine or leaving scripture or leaving the faith if they are correct then Paul what Paul is saying is here that you are not in the tribulation because first there has to be a departing there has to be a leaving a catching up and then the man of sin will be revealed after you've left a catching up a leaving that idea is totally different than if you read it the other way so why would we say that the first seven English translations of the Bible put this verse in exactly that way it said there will first let no man deceive you by any means for that day and it will not come unless there is the departure Wycliffe 1384 Tyndale in 1526 Cloverdale Bible in 1535, the Cranmer Bible in 1539, the Breaches Bible in 1576, the Beza Bible in 1583, the Geneva Bible that the pilgrims used right before the King James was, came out, all translate this verse as departure. There must be a departure. So we can see that apostasia can mean departure as well as a falling from teaching. But notice also that in front of the apostasia there is the what they what the English people call um, an article where it says the falling away or the apostasia but when we translate that back to what it was originally it is there must be the departure not just a departure but a specific event notice verse 5 in this chapter Paul says do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things. So remember, Paul was there three weeks. He taught them. He wrote the first Thessalonians. Now he's writing the second Thessalonians. He's saying, before the tribulation, there's going to be the departing. Now he says, don't you remember I told you this? When did he tell them? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus shall we be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. So Paul is saying, remember the departing I told you about in my first letter? That event that takes place uh, and then the tribulation day or the day of the Lord or the day of wrath? So if you're a believer and you're still here, guess what? You're not in the tribulation. You're not in it. And that's why we can comfort ourselves, comfort one another with his teaching. There are more, many more points to discuss in defense of the pre-tribulation rapture view, but time doesn't allow us to do that here today. One of the most common objections to this view is I would like to deal with, though, is that it can't be right because it didn't arrive on the scene until 1830 through the teaching of an Irish brethren preacher named John Nelson Darby. 
And the argument goes that if the rapture were biblical, uh, it would have appeared in early church history. And this went unanswered for a long time. But until recently, several pre-1830s pre-trib statements have been discovered. Three stand out. A pre-trib position surfaced in the early medieval period in a sermon titled, On the Last Times, the Antichrist and the End of the World. It is a tribute to Ephraim the Syrian or pseudo-Ephraim between the 4th and 6th centuries. And here's what it says. There's a quote from it. And this is really powerful. And I thought, man, when I heard this, this could have been written today. This is what it said. We ought to understand thoroughly, therefore, my brothers, what is imminent or overhanging. Why, therefore, do we not reject every care of earthly actions and prepare ourselves for the meeting of the Lord Jesus Christ so that he may draw us from the confusion which overwhelms all the world? For all the saints and the elect of God are gathered together before the tribulation which is to come and are taken to the Lord in order that we might not see at any time the confusion which overwhelms the world because of sin. According to prophecy scholar Thomas Ives, this statement evidences a clear belief that all Christians will escape the tribulation through a gathering to the Lord and is stated early in the sermon. But later in the second, the second coming of Christ to the earth is mentioned in the sermon near the end. And this sermon is a thousand years before John Nelson Darby appeared. So it does appear in early church history. In 1300, a group known as the Apostolic Brethren, whose former leader was burned at the stake, I think by the Catholics, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was taken over by a, brother, a man named Brother Dulcino. In a brief treatise called The History of Brother Dulcino, it recorded his teaching. Francis Gumerick, an expert on the Brother Dulcino text, clearly believes that it is a pre-tribulation rapture statement. And here's a quote from it. The paragraph from the history of Brother Delcino indicates that in northern Italy in the early 14th century, a teaching very similar to modern pre-tribulationism was being preached. Responding to some very disturbing political and ecclesiastical conditions, Delcino was engaged in detailed speculations about Christian eschatology and believed that the coming of the Antichrist was imminent. He also believed that the means by which God would protect his people from the persecution of the Antichrist would be through a translation of the saints to paradise. A pre-tribulation rapture view was also taught by Morgan Edwards, who lived from 1722 to 1795. He was a Baptist who founded Brown University. There are others as well that prove that the pre-tribulation view has been taught long before John Darby came on the scene. So we see that this is not a recent teaching. Why is that important to you? Why is that important? Because it's not some late come Johnny come lately philosophy. It's been taught by the early church. And so it's still sound doctrine. It declares that God is going to release his wrath on the earth, but those who have put their trust in Jesus will escape the horrors of this tribulation. It declares his unmerited mercy and faithfulness to his people and his righteous judgment on the world who has rejected his son. So let me ask you this morning, does thinking about these events disturb you? Does thinking about this prophecy that's coming that we know that just as all those 300 prophecies about Jesus were fulfilled, all these prophecies in Revelation about the chaos, the end times, the suffering, the agony, does that upset you? Let us examine our hearts have we surrendered it to Jesus? Are we comforted and assured of the fact that when he comes, we're not going to be in there? We're not going to be in that seven years of tribulation because our king is coming to redeem us. Be encouraged. If you have said yes to Jesus, you will not see all those judgments, all those horrors of the coming tribulation. Christ has called you to be his son. Have you answered that call this morning? Have you surrendered? Let a man examine himself. We are living in terrible times. And it is not a time to fall asleep. It is a time to examine our hearts. Are we where we are? Or are, should we be like that verse from Brother Dulcino's message there? We ought to understand thoroughly, my, my brothers, what is imminent 
what is hanging over our heads. I saw a cousin of mine sent me a video. He lives in Johnson City. I don't know how he got it, but he got a video yesterday of some guy at Walmart in Logan out in the parking lot. And his sermon was, uh, now I know folks will say, oh, he's just a misguided, ignorant hillbilly out there preaching in the parking lot at Walmart, right? Well, they probably said that about Noah, didn't they? Huh? They probably said that about John the Baptist. Here's a guy wearing a camel hair vest out here eating locusts and wild honey, and he's talking about the kingdom of God is at hand. They probably said he's ignorant too, didn't they? Well, this ignorant brother of mine, I'm going to call him my brother because I like what he was saying. He's saying, folks, he said, it's, it's getting late. It's getting late. You know, he said, it's later than you think. Folks, listen to Noah preach. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. And eh, they just laughed it off. But you know, it's getting later than you think. And I think the times around us, you can see. There's something in your spirit will tell you. You don't have to be told. Things are not right in our world right now. Things are not right in our country. It's getting late. So, as Brother Delcino said here, why therefore do we not reject every care of earthly actions and prepare ourselves for the meeting of the Lord Jesus Christ so that he may draw us from the confusion that overwhelms this world. Let's stand for prayer. Brother Bill, would you dismiss us with prayer?